Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, their favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And this week's podcast, I'm really excited because our guest sort of taps into something that I'm really trying harder to do every single day, which is be more mindful. But before we talk to our guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host. You know him. You love him. The brain. The professor. Your flight school Sherpa, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. Learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm, I think I'm better than you because you look cold in Tampa. It's like 77 here today. Yeah, it's, uh, you got me beat there. It's, well, it depends. Are we going for the higher score or the lower score? Because... If we're going for the higher, you you win. If we're going for the lower, like in golf, I'm winning. We're going for the more comfortable score. What's that? The more comfortable score. Oh, I think you're winning today. All right. So our guest today is Jonathan Dio. Jonathan is a big deal. He's he's worked in wealth management. He's worked for the big Wall Street behemoth. He's managed a team, you know, managing like two hundred fifty million dollars for 235 families, nonprofits. Um, he's a certified private wealth advisor, but he writes up financial literacy and behavioral wealth management, which I really wanna talk more about. For news outlets like businessinsider.com, uh, mindbodygreen.com, but he's the author of the Amazon bestseller, Mindful Money, Simple Practices for Realizing Your Financial Goals and Increasing Your Happiness Dividend. Jonathan Dio, welcome. Thanks, Mark. Hey, Scott. How you doing? Glad to be here. Um, we're so glad you're here. So, Jonathan, what what made you think about behavioral wealth management? Like, you know, let's just kind of rewind the tape. And one day, you're like, "Oh yeah, this is something people need." So. I mean, I didn't invent behavioral finance, right? That's This is something that's pretty well documented in the academic literature. And there's three now Nobel Prizes for the concepts that are underlying behavioral wealth. My addition is really more of, um, you know, historically, you know, if you go back 30 years, when people talked about financial advice, they talked about uh, man, woman, humankind as rational animals. We get We gather data, we think about that data, we make decisions based upon that data, rationally. Um, and then maybe 15, 20 years ago, psychologists, Kahneman, Tversky were the first and then a bunch of bunch since then have talked about, yeah, it turns out we don't actually gather data. We actually don't look at it rationally. We, uh, you know, there's all kinds of biases that get to it before it gets there. And they say, well, okay, so that's the case. And they, they left us with behavioral finance is an issue. You have to overcome these biases, but they didn't give us a tool. So the thing that I've added onto the list is, okay, if the issue facing us in our successful financial lives is these biases or are these biases, what is the tool that will help us overcome those? And that I believe is mindfulness and my, and actual formal mindfulness training, which means meditation. Interesting. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? Um, I'd like to learn more before I have, before I develop that thought fully. Let's, let's learn more. Well, you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm a big um, behavioral uh, wealth like learner. So I've read Daniel Ariely, uh, uh, Predictably Irrational, and he's got a few other books, and Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, Daniel Kahneman. He won the Nobel Prize. Um, I've read, you know, Michael Lewis's story about those guys. Um, was, was that the Undoing yep. Project? Yeah. I mean, so really really just fascinating brilliant stuff and jonathan can you get a, kind of give us an example of one of these sort of things that you know we just sort of go to default and doesn't make sense in the real world just how our, our minds sort of trick us well i mean there are there are literally dozens of these biases um the the two that i think that we see the most uh are uh, there's this there's this idea that we rationally gather information uh, but really what happens is is before the information enters our minds or or i should say as the information enters our minds our amygdala uh, our our lizard brain decides hey this is 
this idea is something that squares with our previously held beliefs. And so therefore, we're going to actually highlight that and, and allow that to be, to be um, surfaced within the rest of the brain so we can think about it. Or the amygdala might say, hey, you know, this disagrees with a lot of our previously held beliefs. So we're not going to allow that to surface. We're not going to highlight that as something that we should be paying attention to. Um, so if you think about that in that simple brain function, in a world of risk, you know, we become heightened aware to all the things that could go wrong. And this is where, this is where Kahneman Tversky talked about um, how losses hurt us more than positive things help us. So the, the idea is if we, have, if we have a $5 gain, that is pleasurable, but it's not as the, the degree to which it's pleasurable is not as high as a $5 loss is painful. So, so the combination of our brain's filter telling us what should we be paying attention to, and this bias towards negativity um, makes us focus on things that are bad more than we focus on the big picture. And that's really important to understand when you're investing, also when you're spending. There's a difference thing, you know, because if I'm, if I'm, if I'm gonna get excited about something that, that creates this, this emotion about um, how, how I might feel better or the fear of missing out or all these other things, it, 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 it comes, becomes deep ingrained in our brain and affects our spending patterns, it affects our investing patterns. I love it, I love it. Although Jonathan, I, you know, the whole loss aversion thing, I feel like there's a, uh, you know, a counter example. To every rule, well, no, no, I, I do buy it. I, I do buy it. The the one the one counter example is Vegas, because when you think about it, you, we know we're going to lose when we gamble, and yet it's a billion dollar, multi billion dollar industry. Like I personally don't gamble because it's the feeling's not reciprocal. So if I win a hundred dollars, well, it doesn't really move the needle in my life. But if I lose a hundred dollars, like I'm depressed, I start thinking about all the things I could have bought with that hundred dollars. And so, um, that kind of proves the point, Mark, that's precisely what it says. <laughs> well, no, but that's me. Yeah. Right. That's me. But I, you know, like Scott Todd's like making it rain down over oh, there. No, I'm not. You Come know, on, man. he's like that's double like... down. He has no respect for money. No. Unlike Come me. On. Come on. Look, I, I think that Mark, I think that the, um, the, this whole topic is, is an important one because if you think about people that come into land investing, for example, you know, like they come into land investing and it's crazy because you've done, I don't know how thousands of deals. I've done thousands of deals by buying and selling land. I have yet to lose money to, I mean, on a property, right? I haven't lost money on a property. And I'm not saying that, that I've made tons of money on every single sale, but I haven't lost pro money because the way that we buy it okay like it's in the whole whole system of how we buy things we're just not we're, we're setting ourselves up for success right off the bat but there are people that come into this business and they are so afraid of losing okay they become paralyzed right like and and like i can think of like a handful of people that they come in here and they're so afraid of like what if what if i did this or what if i lost that and my old point is look, I spend like $1,700 on a property. Worst case scenario, I lose it all like on that property. It's not like I'm betting the house, right? These are small little bets in our business. And I'd love to know from Jonathan, like, okay, Jonathan, how does someone come in here and understand like, if my maximum loss is let's say $1,000, but, and that's gonna paralyze me, how do I get through that? How do I tell my brain to shut up and let me just go do this thing? I, I mean, I think the, re the reality is, and, and I, I totally appreciate that context. Like if the maximum loss is a thousand bucks, how can I just, how can I move forward? But I think the challenge is most people don't recognize and do the math to figure out what the maximum loss is. Most people don't even get to the space where, hey, we're thinking about we're thinking about land investing. We're thinking about investing in the market. We're thinking about properties. We're thinking about most people that we see in the world have zero practical knowledge when it comes to personal finance. So when I, in in writing the book, all, the thing I'm trying to figure out, the thing I'm trying to help people do is say, okay, there are all these illusions that are out there in the world, um, and if you spend any time on social media, you see the illusions every single day. Um, this is all basically crap that people are using to 
express who they are. They're signaling. This is, you know, if, if they're driving a fantastic car, it may or may not be their car, uh, right? If they're jet setting, it may or may not be their jets. Um, uh, and this is just something to be aware of when you're thinking about when you're interacting with the world, you don't have to covet that. The thing we have to do is we have to really break down and figure out what are the simple steps that we can take? What is the simple, you know, inflow outflow? And then after you get through those basic things, you look at the, the question you're asking. And that is, that is, okay, here's a deal. Here is something that could help me create wealth for myself, for my family. Here's the upside. Here's the downside. Here are the levers I can pull to make a difference, to make it higher probability of upside, lower probability of downside. And if, if we can get them the basic education, I'm all about financial literacy and getting people the basic education. And that really opens up the door to beginning to have the conversation about, okay, loss versus gain. What are the levers I can pull to make a difference in this equation? And then how many of these things do I have to stack up so that I can actually have that wealth, success, you know, financial independence for myself and for my family? Makes sense. Makes sense. So let's just talk about some simple principles in the book. What are some of the more fundamental, simple principles that we're going to learn when we read the book? So the book is, again, it's broken out into three parts. The first part is, you know, I use, I use, I'm a Buddhist, so I use eight. Eight's an important number in Buddhism. It could be nine, could be seven, not, not being too specific here. Um, there are eight you know, foundation mistakes that people make that are fed by lack of education on the topics that are fed by uh, media, financial punditry, um, you know, that, that we have this you know, inkling that it's this way. And then the world gives us all kinds of information to support it's this way, but it's just not that way. Okay. Um, so there's this, the first section of the book is to debunking the financial myths. The middle section of the book is, and I, I'm, once we get past education, I'm about planning. Uh, so uh, it, everyone should begin with the end in mind, right? Begin with the end in mind. Think about, okay, I want to go here. What are the steps I need to take? You know, if my goal is 10 years from now, what do I have to have done in five years, three years, two years, you know, one year, this quarter, this week, today? What are the steps, the building blocks to get there? Have a plan in place. Uh, and then that plan should be based on, and I go to mindful, I go to happiness, like I, I talk about the happiness dividend, right? So how do I get a happy life? How do I have a life filled with meaning? And I think there's eight pillars. I think there's eight things we focus on. Things like meaning and accountability and generosity and gratitude and optimism and relationships and health. And these are things that when we focus on these and make these the foundation of our plan, then we have a much higher probability of having a happy, more meaningful life. And I think that that, you know, money kind of underlies this stuff. It's not this stuff, but money can have an effect on any one of these topics. So then the third part of the book, um, you know, so now we have, we have things don't believe, then we have things to believe, things to focus on. And then the third part of the book is, is putting, putting numbers to it. Um, thinking about what your personal goals are. We talked about in the middle part, we talked about what generally leads to a life of happiness and well-being. What is specific to you for your happiness and your well-being and focus on that and create that plan that puts numbers to it and gets from here to there. That's the simple thing. Ignore, embrace, plan. Ignore, embrace, plan. So I don't know about Scott Todd, but I, I've been a long term meditator for years now and mm -hmm. I meditate every morning. You know, now I'm, now I'm up to an hour a day. And I, I have to say, like, it's one of my favorite things to do during the day is just to sit and watch the nature of my mind. And really, when you, you get you get to this point where you have enough mindfulness and you kind of you sort of realize the illusion of uh, duality, right? Like you think like there feels like there's a thinker behind your face sometimes. And then you, you're, you meditate and I'm like, wait, 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 where's the thinker? Uh, Scott Todd's rolling his eyes. He probably doesn't know. I, but anyways, I, Scott. I don't know what you're talking about. I know, I know. Just, just trust me. Like, it, it, you get to this point and every, we're, all, we're all constantly talking to ourselves. Constantly, incessantly. And usually they're not nice thoughts. You know, it's usually worries or, yep. you know, beating yourself up. It's, it, and I get it from an evolutionary standpoint, like, if you're just sitting by the 
<laughs> by the pond, steering, having a good old time, you get eaten. So we're kind of like always on hyper alert now, but now nothing, no one's going to eat us. So the paradox that I'd love to know how you sort of uh, reconcile this in wealth management is in Buddhism, you know, desire, we know desire, so this, this contract we're for unhappiness until we get what we want, right? As, as, we're, as we're going through that journey. Um, and then we get it, and then it lasts for 15 minutes, and now we're on to the next thing. So, but we can't just sit in a cave all day watching our breath either. So it's, it's this paradox. How do you reconcile this paradox of, you know, we know that we're going to adapt to whatever we get. You know, Scott Todd bought a plane. Great. I don't have a plane. I'm jealous of him. That's a whole other thing. But like at some point, Scott's going to get used to the plane. He's going to adapt to it. And he's like, oh, now I need a bigger plane. Now I need a jet. Right. <laughs> and then he's going to go out and do the things to go and get a jet. Um, and yet, so how do we how do we how do we reconcile this? It's a long winded question, Jonathan. I know. I, I don't know that it's even a question. <laughs> well, how, yeah. How how do we how do we how do we got, live our best lives knowing in at some level it's while we're chasing these this this stuff it's not going to make us happy, and yet there's a happiness dividend at the end of it I, when you're mindful I, enough. The, the, the stuff doesn't give you the lead to the happiness dividend. And I don't think Scott purchased the plane so that he would be happier. I think he did, he did it for convenience, for speed of travel, for, or maybe he thought, maybe he thought, you know, if I just have this plane, I'll be, I'll, I'll be happy, right? Maybe I, you know, I don't know Scott well, but I'm assuming that's probably not the case. Um, and uh, uh, so how do you reconcile these two things? It's, it's, it's very difficult, but the first thing is to understand that the thing is not going to give you happiness. That's what we talk about. The, the, the first set of the book is to debunk these myths. The thing does not lead to happiness. In fact, many of us set up our lives and I have clients that, you know, we talk about this a lot. You know, if only I had finished that degree or if only I got that raise or if only I get that position, I will be happy. And if, if you're constantly basing your well being and your happiness on an outcome, then you're missing it. You're missing the journey itself. And this is, you know, this is easy for me to talk about. And it may be easy for you guys to talk about as well, because, you know, I'm doing really, really well. It hasn't always been thus, right? And I, so I do know that struggle is there and struggle is, is something that's real. And, and so you have to overcome that. And it's very difficult to say, well, no, if I just need to sit and watch my mind, then I'll, I'll, I'll be better off. Um, and that's kind of not the promise of the, the promise of meditation isn't financial success. That's not, we're not saying that, Hey, you meditate, you'll be financially successful. What I'm saying is if you're meditating, you, you will be happier and have more well being, regardless of the financial outcome. Uh, the financial outcome is a target. It's something that people look at in our culture specifically as a goal. You know, if you go to Asia or even Canada, it's less a goal. It's still important and people want to be successfully financial, successful financially, but, but it's not quite the same God that it is in the United States. It's, it's a big thing here. And so when I'm talking about, hey, let's, let's back off of that a little bit and just see what, what is it that leads to meaning, happiness and well-being. And there's an enormous volume of research on this. And we look at those, those list of eight or nine or 10 things that we just mentioned, right? The health and the relationships and optimism. And these things actually lead to lives well lived regardless of finance. So it's interesting, you know, I have taught uh, budgeting and financial literacy at halfway houses in San Francisco. I have taught uh, retirement planning at uh, community colleges. I've worked one-on-one -on -one with, you know, multi-generational trusts and wealthy, wealthy, wealthy individuals. None of those people are free of fear and concern around money. Not the people that don't have it, not the people that have it. So that's interesting to me. It's interesting to me that no matter who you talk to, there's concern, worry, fear around money. That tells me it's not 
whether you have it or whether you don't have it. It's about something that's going on internally. And so Mark, when you sit, and when I sit every single day, we start to become acquainted with that conversation in our own heads. And it's the conversation in our own heads and becoming acquainted with that conversation that allows us to have happier, more meaningful lives, regardless of financial outcomes. It's nice to have a plane. It's nice to be living in a nice house. It's nice to take great vacations. It's nice. Those things alone don't make us happy. They're additive, but those things alone don't make us happy. You have to have a mindset that kind of undergirds that as well. I, Silence. Yeah. No, I agree. <laughs> and I, I talk about this in, in my book as well, in my journey, and because I, I got all these things and I still was miserable. But um, Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? I mean, look, I, I don't think... Um... Uh, okay, like for me, the the plane or the things that I have, with with some exceptions, like the plane is not a joy thing for me. The plane has always been like a tool, right? Like I see it as a tool. What's it a tool for? Well, it's a tool to to get me to go to places that I want to go to, um, or to get me to travel. Now, do I enjoy flying the plane? I do. I, like I'm not gonna deny I don't like enjoy flying it. But I never really bought the plane saying like, okay, I'm going to buy this plane. I'm going to be like instantly happy and then I'm miserable. And I think that, I think that what Jonathan said is right. Like if you're, if you're buying something thinking this is going to make me happy, well, you get the instant gratification pop and then, then you don't. And, you know, like I, I, I kid my wife all the time. I'm like, um, should we go look for a new house? Like you, you know, let, let's go, let's go look at a big house or let's go, let's go find the million dollar house. And then I'm like, it's kind of a pain to go move, you know, like it, it it's uh, maybe we'll just stay right here, you know, cause we're living a good life now. Right. Like we'll just stay where we are. And, or then you say like, well, let's just go do this or let's go on this vacation. Well, vacation is, is a trip to memory. It's, it's something that you can have there. Does it bring you joy and happiness? I mean, you go on vacation, you create a memory, you have, you, you have time with your family. It could make you happy, but then you're going to come back and you're going to be like, can I just go on vacation again? So I think, I think that you're right. Like it's, it's really not about um, buying things to make you happy because that's not going to make you happy. You got to find what's going to make you happy. And whether it's service or helping others or doing something else, that's ultimately what I think will make you happy. And, bring joy to your life. Oh, boom. That's it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree with Scott. And, um, as I get older, I'm, I'm realizing there's, you know, everywhere I go, there I am. So it's really just, you know, I could, I could fly first class. Well, not now, but when COVID lifts, to, you know, to, to some exotic location in Hawaii. But if my mind is constantly thinking about, you know, let's just pick on Scott again, you know, I'm in Hawaii, but now Scott's, you know, doing these cool things, playing golf and, you know, doing these other things and I'm, and I'm filled with jealous rage. Does it really matter that I'm on this beautiful beach in Maui if that's where my mind is at? So I do think that, you know, being aware of this and, and really being completely present does translate to happiness uh, as well. So to your point, Jonathan, like it can, it's, it's never, it's almost never enough, right? That's the, that's the big question is, is what for me in the, in the whole planning thing, when you, when you base your plan on what makes you happy, you know, what they pick, there's a menu of things the academics talk about that lead to happiness. And then pick among the, what, what is it among that many, what is the things that really lead to my happiness? What's important to me? And you prioritize those things and you let the other things go. The key is you got, you got to make trade-offs. There's, you don't have infinite resources. You got to make trade-offs. So if I build the plan on that and I really, I really am focused on what makes me happy and that make that the center, make that the core, make that the foundation, then that's enough. Right. I mean, I don't need to have, if you're at Mark, if you're, you know, if you're on the beach and Scott's golfing in Fiji and you're jealous, if you're filled with jealous rage about that golf trip, then I would say that your being on the beach wasn't skillful, wasn't where you wanted to be. Like, so you didn't start with what was really important to you. And so it's, it's really key, really key 
to start with what's important to you, prioritize. And I think that we, we never learn anything practical about what is the source of happiness? I mean, maybe our parents said, hey, you know, family is important. Or maybe our parents said, you know, there's a value in working hard. There's a value in, in uh, being creative. Maybe we got some of those messages, but by and large, I don't think most people, unless you study psychology or philosophy or religion, kind of get to that point of, hey, these are the things that create meaningful lives. Um, but if we do a little bit of research, you know, read some of the philosophers, read some of the great, uh, uh, you know, Viktor Frankl, read Man's Search for Meaning, read, read some of these things. And then maybe if we sit and contemplate these things, we can get to, we can figure out what's important to us and what would be our enough. And that's, once we know what our enough is, we pursue our enough, nothing else matters. That's where we get to be happy. That's where we get, that's where meaningful, meaningful, meaningful lives comes from. I, I love it. I, and I love that you, you wrote the book and you have a, a plan for people to not just maximize their wealth, but then at the end of it, be more mindful of the ways that, okay, you've got this solid financial plan. Here's how you're going to get to happiness and have that happiness dividend and, um, and just use, use this as a tool to get to where you want to create this, this meaningful life and a life well lived. And, um, I think it's, it, it's great. And, and it definitely differentiates you from 99.9% .9 of wealth advisors out there. So Mark, I would, I would just say this, like, I would just say one last thing. Look, I don't think there's anything wrong. Like you were talking about the whole uh, Maui thing, right? Like, I don't think that there's anything wrong with like you being in Maui and okay, maybe if you're not enjoying it, that's one thing. But like, if you're looking back going, geez, man, like Scott's playing golf or he's flying or he's doing whatever, man, that guy's got the life right there's to me there's nothing wrong with saying one one more sentence after that which is man what's he doing so that i can replicate it so i can live that so i can be free like him too and i'm not gonna say like live like him but like so that if, if any one person can do it well then other people can do it, it you know like if jeff bezos can do it like anybody else can do it now yes that's a far fetch. I get it. But it's, that's the thing is like, he brought no special skills other than desire. And he put teams in place to get him to where he is today. And I can do the same thing. It starts here in your brain and you just got to get past that. There's a, I, I, I totally, I totally agree that it's possible. Anyone can do anything. Like I, I really do in my heart, believe that. I think that I think that the, it's really important though to understand that you may, you may not want to do that. Right. So the, issue, the issue with the brain is uh, it, void of a better, more thoughtful approach to what's enough for me. I will pursue whatever is thrown at me. And the issue is if Mark is on the beach and Scott is flying and Mark is jealous of Scott, if, if that's really what he wants, man, Mark, go, go for it. Like, that's fantastic. Then that's ask right. yourself the question, is it really what I want? Don't just do it because, you know, oh, there's the next shiny thing. You don't want to chase shiny things because there's no happiness in chasing shiny things. It's finding what's important to me first and then pursuing that. And in the process of finding what's important to you, you'll pick from, you know, the, the menu of options, which are some of the things that we talked about and the plane and the fast car and the big house and the great vacations, those are all on the menu. Um, but you have to make choices. And that's the, that's where people struggle is I got to make choices. What are, what are going to be my choices? Yeah, no, we, we could talk about this, uh, forever. It's such an, it's such an interesting, deep topic. And we can talk about stoic philosophy and, and, um, you know, go deeper into, uh, behavioral management and Dan Ariely and all these irrational things that we do. And, miswanting and and i mean it just it's 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 an incredible incredibly interesting rabbit hole to me but unfortunately jonathan we're at that point in the podcast where we're going to ask ask you for one more tip of the week a website a resource another book something else actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses improve their lives what do you got so uh, there's this 
my whole life changed when I, in 2008, when I started doing a couple different things. And the thing that, that the one book that helped me get through this was um, Stephen Pressfield's The Art of War, um, which is a fantastic book for people that are struggling to finish a creative project or start a creative project. And so this was, I was trying to get through my book, um, write, finish writing my book. And I just, you know, up against the wall, up against the wall, up against the wall. And Stephen's book, uh, Stephen Pressfield's book, really sort of talks about that struggle and what is it inside our brains that makes that struggle happen and how do we overcome that struggle? And so it's, I know that many people deal with the struggle and I would highly recommend Stephen Pressfield's The Art of War. Um, uh, or is it the war of art, the war of art, the Sorry. war of art, the war of, war of art. Yeah. 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 That's the right one. Yeah. The great book. Great book. Um, before we get to Scott Todd's tip of the week, I just want to give, give a quick shout out to our sponsor flight school, learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life. Go up the mountain of land investing with Scott Todd, who's done it thousands of times, go up that mountain quickly, safely, efficiently. The tuition for flight school ain't going to cost you nothing because you're going to make it back 180 days or less guaranteed in either terms or cash deals. Learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training, thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, check out this book, Everybody Writes by Anne Hadley. Okay, like everybody writes. Okay. And today's society, all business owners, they become uh, media empires. If they're doing it right, if you have a website, you are a publisher. If you're on social media, just even with your friends, you are in marketing. So create a system that will give you good content all the time. Everyone writes. All right. Fantastic. Well, my tip of the week is uh, arguably the best tip of the week because it's literally going to change your life. Just go to mindful.money, mindful.money. Um, get Jonathan's book, Mindful Money, Simple Practices for Realizing Your Financial Goals and Increasing Your Happiness Dividend. And um, it's, a, it's a really interesting concept of, of, of taking uh, you know, this mindfulness approach and applying it to wealth management. So I highly recommend everyone do that, mindful.money. Um, I want to thank the listeners and remind them the only way we're going to get the quality guests like a Jonathan Dio is if you do us three little favors. You got to subscribe, rate, review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you the $97 wholetailing course, how to double your money, 30 days or less, for free. So please do it. All right, Jonathan, are we good? We're good. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Scott. Scott, are we good? We're good, Mark. Let's do this. One, two, three. Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. All right. Jonathan got it. He got it. Thanks, everybody.